We're going to pick back up at Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to pick back at 15 and verse 16. because There's a connection there. It says here, 15, when it says looking for us, that means we should be seeking this deliberately. So it says looking or seeking diligently. Now let's freeze on those two words right there. Whatever follows is serious because he's not only saying seek, but to seek diligently. Just seeking and seeking diligently are two opposing things. To seek diligently, you must be consistent and obedient to what God has told us to do. And what is this that we're supposed to be looking diligently at? It says looking diligently lest, uh-oh, now it's telling us if we don't, the consequence could be, and what does it say? Looking diligently lest any man fall of the grace of God. It's freeze right there. I don't know about you all, but that's when we fall out of grace with God, we are people most miserable. Because there is no other hope outside the grace of God. The grace of God is what allows us to love, to have mercy, to have grace on other people, just like the grace God gave us. So when it says for anybody to fall out of the grace of God, I would want to know what I need to do. Because all, when everything is said and done, what allows us to have incredible access to God through Christ's blood is God's grace. So may we never just haphazardly read over this. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I love to tell Christians this all the time. As a Christian, you have to guard your heart. You do. Somebody can make you upset one day, and then you hold on to it, and if you don't cast your care over to Jesus or know how to channel that anger, you know what happens? Then bitterness sweeps in. And then before you know it, you may do something that one day you'll sit back and say, boy, I wish I had not done that. And you have to remember the reason that you did it was because it wasn't handled right. When we, whenever I get upset about anything, the first thing my mind goes to, Brother Charles, is the grace of God. And why is that? Because I'll say, well, I got to forgive this guy because God forgave me. Who am I to say, I'm not going to forgive him. May those words never come out of my mouth or be under meditation of my heart. Because God forgave me and still does forgive me. So can we let that energy reign in us versus the energy of bitterness, which can lead me to being out of the grace of God? We end up hurting our own selves if we aren't careful. I tell people, think of those scriptures that God told you. When God said, vengeance is mine, that's supposed to be for us to say, wow, I, I, I'm thankful for that. I don't have to worry if somebody shoots me and all of a sudden they get away with, oh, no, they didn't. They may get a little bit of glory on this side of life, but it won't be permanent. Because God said, vengeance is mine. We have to be able to accept that. And James hits this very well. He says, let patience have her perfect work. Because what allows you to accept that, and most importantly, what allows you to live with that, is knowing that I just have to be patient. You know, we live, I love how Gail says, we live in a microwave society. Gotta have it now, gotta have it now. If it takes a computer two seconds to turn on, that's too slow. It's gotta be a millimeter of a second or a millisecond. That's the society gets us in that pace. There's nothing wrong with that with a computer, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, we try to use that in everything in life. And that's not how God operates. God operates on his timetable. And why is that so important? Because God is on the outside of time. Time didn't hold God accountable. Time holds us accountable. But we serve an individual that's outside the time domain, which means he can do whatever he chooses. Don't you want to be in him? And be on, his, be on his table? That's what Christianity is all about. Bible continues. Looking diligently, lest any man fall, fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Your angerness can be multiplied. I remember seeing something uh, 
I like to watch sports follies. So it's when things go wrong sometimes. And they had a, this was happened many, many years ago. I think it was the Chicago White Sox. The pitcher pitched the ball. The guy hit the ball, but it, the ball went up and went back into the stands. And there was a guy over there just acting clown and clown, and his son was with him. And the ball hit him on the side of the head, so everybody started laughing. And they put the camera on him. And, you know, at, at sports events, they put it on the big screen. So he looked up and saw people laughing at him on the screen and just put his middle finger up. I'm sure you all know what that means. Put his finger up, and then his little son was looking at him laughing, and his son, right beside his dad, put his finger up too. He couldn't have been no more than six or seven years old. I said, what is he teaching that young man? Just because he chose to defile himself, because just because people laugh, it doesn't mean you have to go and get going rage for them. No, you can just sit there. It was an accident anyway. Things happen. Have you ever laughed at something and caught yourself like, I really shouldn't be laughing at that? Because that's human nature. That what's bad is his six-year-old, seven-year-old son did the same thing. He wouldn't know the difference until he, until he was a grown man. And by then, it was probably baked in. But the Bible word is defilement. Most defilement comes from patterns. Patterns that we see. And if you see a pattern when you're a young man and you keep doing it, it becomes, it becomes a habit. And that's horrible. May we not be found in that same life. Verse 16, and here's another one. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Now it's funny, we don't have time to go to that story, but when you go to that story in Genesis, Esau had the birthright from his father Isaac. It was natural, he didn't have to do anything. He was born, firstborn, so he had the birthright. But he had an opportunity, he thought, to get something else. So he sold his birthright for some soup jars. Then later on, he realized, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. They wouldn't give it back. You see where that patience comes in again? Can we have that kind of patience? Are there things in our life that will come, come up to us as a quote-unquote opportunity? But is it right for us? Years ago for me, I had an opportunity. I was unemployed and I was looking. And I had a guy call me from a particular government agency. He said, we heard you're a preacher. And I said, well, who told you that? He says, I don't remember, but he said, you're a preacher. And I, and I remember you from a place called Bay Point. Bay Point was a private provider for the Department of Juvenile Justice, a government agency. He says, and a lot of people say you can preach. And if I was getting kind of excited, Sister Valerie, he said, we'd like for you to join us and be a chaplain. You know, a chaplain, you gotta be careful with that term. I was like, well, what does it entail? Well, we're gonna send you to seminary you know, seminaries has a lot to do with Catholicism. And I was like, well, what's my requirement when I get on a job? You got to teach from the rosary and everything else. I said, he says, good money too. He would, although he said good money, he would never say how much though. And I thought about it hard because you know what was on my heart, Brother Jesse? Boy, our bills are piling up and we need to pay for them. But I couldn't let that supersede. I'm not going to stand up there and preach false doctrine for nobody. And I said, no, no. He said, really? They, they said you would go for this. I said, sir, I teach from the Bible. Well, this is from the Bible. I said, the rosary is not from the Bible. You mean to tell me you're going you're gonna to say the Pope and all of them are wrong? No, I'm just saying the Bible is right. You know, you want to, don't let them pull you into the negative energy. It's like, no, no, no. I'm saying the Bible is right. And I'll stand up. I said, I'd be glad to sit down with anybody you have that's a chaplain on what they believe. And we can look at it with the Bible. You didn't want to go there, though. I was like, God, thank you. I didn't let my desire to want to do right. A man needs to work. Because a man got to take care of his body. If a man didn't work, he's worse than an infant death. But that's not saying you take any and everything. Because everything that, that Christians are defined by is biblical. Everything else is secondary. We got to serve that first. The Bible says in verse 17, For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessings, talking about Esau, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance that he sought it carefully with tears. You know, don't let that, that the term repentance, and we're going to do some more teaching on that, 
Sometimes repentance is so short. People will say, well, I feel so sorry. Why? Because I did something wrong. And then it, that's where it ends. That's not repentance. Feeling sorry is an indicator of, to lead you to repentance. It's like if I'm driving on the turnpike and all of a sudden it comes to a screeching halt and I see all this whole long line of cars and then I see truckers, uh, 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 what do you call them? I mean, you call, I see a tow truck and I see uh, EMT and the fire and the police come rearing by me. The indicator is there's an accident up there and that's what's going on. When you see tears, that should be an indicator that this should lead you to repentance. But sorry, being sorrowful is not the is not the all in all in repentance. And then people go on, you know what? I need to go ahead and change. That's true, but just stating it is not what repentance is either. It starts in the mind, but there has to be followed up with an action. So make sure, and when you go back and look at, uh, remember how we do things, Trump. When you go back and look at the gentleman who betrayed Jesus, and we all know who that is. When you look at that, people love to pull this out. It says, it says God repented. Well, one of the things you got to remember with the English word, you got to go back and look at the original. The original word is relented. Relent and repent are two different things. Repent is something you do when you've done wrong and now you're going to do right. Key word is do. Relent is simply changing your mind. God can change his mind not because he did anything wrong. He just chose to change his mind. And that individual did not repent at all. He went and actually committed suicide. So heaven, he could not go. That's what happens when you find yourself in guilt and sorrow, all those are indicators that you should repent. That's not repentance in and of itself. I feel so bad because I did that. Ooh, maybe let me give it a few days and I'll feel better. That's not repentance. That can be a part of it. It's an indicator. I tell people our emotions, our emotions can be the best thing or the worst thing. When emotions just rule you, it's bad. Because emotions come from the flesh. Why were they given to us? To give us an indicator. You ever done something wrong and know, or you aren't sure if you're doing something and you just got a gut feeling? I remember one time a lady confronted me and I confronted her. And as we were talking, I was realizing it's like, you know what? She's actually right in this context. And I got around and said, ma'am, I'm so sorry my emotions jump out. What you said was exactly right. I should have waited before I came in. I won't go into all the detail, but she was right. It was important for me to get it right, right then and there. I felt it, I felt in my gut, it's like, no, they actually, this lady's right. Both of my sons are great at that. They'll listen and it's like, no, wait, wait a minute, this is right. And I love to see them do that. That's a powerful attribute of Christianity. You should get it right as soon as you can because you don't know when your soul will be quiet. And you don't want that to be on, on your list of, oh man, I didn't do right and I was aware of it. That's the key thing when you're made aware. You know what the Bible says? One of the powerful things of baptism is we know that it adds us to the church. We know that it allows the Holy Spirit to come in. We know that it saves us. But you know what else Peter tells us? It's an answer of a good conscience towards God. We forget that part. Everybody has a natural conscience just from the spirit of life when you're born. But when you're baptized and the Holy Spirit enters you, it's like your conscience is on positive steroids now. It's really on alert. You know when you're doing wrong and you know when you should get it right. The question is, do you tie into that? That's why it's called the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You know what the Holy Spirit works in conjunction with? It works in conjunction with the word of God. You want to know why that's so powerful? We read it in Hebrews 4, 12. It says, for the word of God is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the, bo and the joints and marrow. You know what that means? The word of God with the Holy Spirit goes deep into you. 
For what reason? The last part of that verse said, and is. What comes next, God? And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Don't haphazardly read over that. That's a promise. If you allow the Holy Spirit to work within you and you give the Holy Spirit what it needs to work with you, that's getting into the word of God. I tell people, God has set this up for us to make it and to make it. The Bible says we're more than conquerors. He set this up for us to be super successful. But are we doing the work to do that? Think of those of you that are Dolphin fans. Think of the quarterback just saying, I, I ain't, I'm not practicing. I'm going to sit out to the first game. Wouldn't some of you Dolphin fans have an issue with that? Of course, it's like, man, they're paying you millions of dollars and you're not even going to practice? No, what about Christianity? God has said, my son died for you. He set up a way for you to be saved and a way for you to remain being saved even when you mess up, as long as you're sincere. But are you going to do what I've said by allowing the Holy Spirit to indwell you and you taking the time to take in my word? He's got it right here. And the last time I checked, it's not hard to get a Bible. As a matter of fact, there's anybody here who doesn't have one that needs one, just make your request known. Because you can't be a Christian without God's word. You can't develop as a Christian without God's holy word. But make it, you've heard evangelism. It's personal because it's what you're supposed to do. So we're here in organized Bible study. After this, we're going to have organized worship. Wednesday, we have organized Bible study again. What are you doing with this book outside of those times? To let God know this is valuable to you. That's what this whole journey is about. Let us continue. We'll try to leave time for questions too. Let us continue. Verse 17. For ye know how that afterward, when we would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully. With, I'm sorry, we just read that one. Verse, before I move on, you know what's the parallel for us? He's talking about Esau, but there's a parallel for us. We have a blessing of heaven. I don't know about you all, but me and Tony was talking about this earlier. We know how great that is. How often do you just meditate on that and say, I'm going to heaven? That's like you're running a race, and that's what we are. We're running this like a marathon, but you can see the finish line. You can see the finish line. It doesn't matter how tired you are or how beat up you are. There's the finish line. You're going to crawl. You're going to roll. You're going to skip. You're going to do something to get to that finish line because you know what the reward is. Are we going to let something forfeit our blessing on this side of life? Is there anything that can make you forfeit your blessing? And Lord forbid for it to be for somebody to make you mad and you're all out of place. I have met people. I won't call this gentleman's name, but he had a big impact on me teaching. I met him early when I came to Miami, Florida. I mean, he would get up and take some of the most hardcore questions and just break it down like he knew. And I was like, man, that's what I'm talking about. He knew where to go in the Bible just at the drop of a hat. Someone made him upset. And at least the last time I heard, he never came back. We even went by his house and he called out that person's name. I'm going to do that today. But my whole thing for him is like, brother, you're a big reason why I want to develop as a teacher now. Why are you letting it? There's just some things you don't understand, brother. I was like, well, please enlighten me. Because my understanding is you know the Bible. He just wouldn't let it go. And understand, we all have our perfect storms. There's always something that can get under our skin that may, get, that may not get under other people's skin. But we, may we realize, am I going to let this separate me from the love of God? The book of Romans says nothing can separate us from the love of God. So that means we're letting it in and letting it trump how, how good God is. When I, many of you know I worked in juvenile justice with the at-risk kids. And the place where I worked at, it was a residential place, so they lived on campus. And if they did a good job, got good grades, and obeyed, they could eventually work up where they could go home for the weekend. Then they would come back, and they could do that each time as long as they uh, uh, met the criteria. 
And it was one particular kid that was one step from going home, Brother Jesse. And he talked about it all the time. I go home, and play with my young brother, and he misses me. I was like, all right. One kid cursed him out. He threw a punch. They went to talk. And then so they both were in trouble. So I pulled the one kid to the side. I said, wow, you don't love your brother at all. That's not right, Mr. Nelson. Yes, I do. I said, no, you don't love your mother either. How can you say that? I love my mom. I messed up, but I realized what I was doing. Then why aren't you going home to see him? Because it's not my fault. I got into a fight. I was like, exactly. That young man threw words at you. Why couldn't you say, well, you know what? I don't care what you say because I'm going home this weekend. And he was just looking and he started seeing tears coming down. I was like, you let the anger for that young man trump the love for your family. And it was amazing. He got it right after that. And boy, was he one of the best kids I've ever worked with. That's a perfect metaphor for what we're supposed to do in Christianity when people get on our nerves. I'll never forget that man who taught so well and let that one thing pull him out of it. I don't know what the individual said or how it got to him, but whatever it was, it was his perfect storm. You know, you all know Peter. Peter was walking on water in the midst of all high winds and everything, too. He looked at it for a while and fell. But you know who was right in the midst of that storm? Jesus the Christ. And may we never forget that. We have these 66 books so we can reference when we're going through something so we can apply it. I love my brother sitting in the back said this one day. Remember when those bands came out years ago? What would Jesus do? Nothing wrong with that. But he said it should be, what did Jesus do? Because once we study the Bible, we know what Jesus did. And then we know how we can do that. I had a debate with a young lady years ago because the congregation was having a fish fry and they would wash cars and they'd pass out tracks and everything. People came through, nothing wrong with that. She said, where is that in the Bible? I said, they didn't do no fried fish in the Bible. They weren't washing cars in the, in the Bible. I said, you take the biblical principle and apply, apply, apply it today. I said, they didn't have Zoom in the Bible either, but we use Zoom today and she, she's always on Zoom. <laughs> I said, we didn't have Zoom back then. But it's the principle. The principle then was connection. What was the principle there? The principle with the fish was you're meeting a personal need in order to give them the spiritual need. So Jesus gave fish. It just wasn't fried. They didn't have portable fryers back then. We do now. So we fried the fish. We gave it to them. We washed the cars meeting needs. But before they left, guess what they got? They got a Bible study and track. So don't let people use, I like how Paul called it, this vain babble. She happened to be a member of the Baptist church and had a big issue with us. So that was just a channel to try to do that. I said, well, and she ultimately, she did agree. I said, now we need, we need to agree on what the Bible says about the plan of salvation. Oh, no, you can't move me from that. I said, okay. I said, hopefully God will one day. Because my job is just to tell you what the Bible says. God saves you. I said, but you got to have an open heart for that. You just can't lock it down. I said, every time you came to me with some doctrine, I listened to you. And then because I disagree, and I didn't just disagree, I looked at what the word of God says. You got upset at me. You said doctrine was not essential because the thief on the cross. And I told you, I understand why you think that. You got to keep reading. Because when the thief was on the cross, baptism for, for remission of sins wasn't even instituted yet. Said it didn't come to after Acts chapter 2 when the, when the birth of the church came. That's in your Bible. She don't want to hear it. She had an issue with, well, why, why can't you let sister, the young ladies preach? I can preach better than you. I said, you probably can. But did God tell you to do that? Yes, God did. Well, when, when did he tell you to do that? Well, didn't the Bible say there's, 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 there's uh, uh, no difference between man and woman, male and female, Jew or Greek? I said he was talking about with admittance into his kingdom. Not about the jobs that follow there. Everybody has equal opportunity. Jesus' blood is spread for the whole world. But once we get into the church, God has specifically laid out responsibilities. He clearly said that a woman is not to usurp the, usurp the, third, uh, us, usurp the authority of man. Which means a woman can't teach over a man. That's God. You can call me a, a, a Male chauvinists all you want to. I'm just showing you what the Bible says. You got an issue, take it up with God. 
but you got to make it so you can take it up with it. You may disagree, but you got to obey. I said, we learned that as kids. I may disagree with my mom, but as a kid, she says, you go do that. She may say, and you all know I bring this up all the time. She may say, take your trash out before Spider-Man. I may think like, well, there's still, it's just 30, Spider-Man is a 30 minute show. I can take it out after. But that's not what she said, child. And then when it was time and that trash wasn't taken out and that belt came out, didn't I tell you? Yes, I, I deserved it because I chose to do it my way. And that's what a lot of people in the denominational world try to do now with the Bible. And it's sad because God has made it abundant. And they use the same Bible in most cases. They say, wow, study it. But the Bible says, verse 18, for ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that uh, burn with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempers. What is that talking about? I love how it always goes back to the Old Testament. You know, God spoke directly to Moses. You know, many times when Moses went on Mount Sinai to meet God, there was smoke, there was fire, there was all kind of things that would, to the human eye, probably scare us. But Moses knew this is God's presence. We have access to this. What I love about what the Holy Spirit is doing with the book of Hebrews, it's also, remember the original intent was to get those Jewish Christians who were considering going back He's trying to let him know. He was like, wait a minute, now remember. When one of your forefathers, Moses, came up and talked to me, you're going to deny all of that? Because all that was leading to the New Testament. And man, we never forget that. I love to always tell people, when you're, if you're part of a denomination, God never, you can't find one scripture that lets you know that God authorized denomination. You're trying to go into something that God never authorized. At least these folks were trying to go something. At one point, God did authorize the Jewish religion. But now when Christ came, no. Now we have the New Testament. So at least they were trying to go back into something that God authorized. Those in denominations, God has never authorized that. And I'm still, it still blows my mind other than the fact that you may have family members that you know, you're connected to. I do get that. Still doesn't make it right, but I get that. But just to join one, when you look at denomination means, it's multiple. I teach math. When you look at a fraction, top number is a the, the, the numerator, the bottom number is denominator. The top number means how many pieces of the whole. The bottom number means the whole. So it's like, so if you're, if you're a denominator, then you're saying you're a part of something a part of something that's been fractured. Jesus never supported that anywhere in the Bible. Even when Peter spoke, God intervened. God cut him off while he was talking. This is my beloved son, hear ye him. Peter wanted to set up three, if you look at the actual word, there's three sacred tents. I said, no, 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 you're just gonna listen to Jesus. You're not gonna break this up and end up having your own doctrine. Jesus even prayed that they all may be one. And it even mentions, I pray that there's no divisions among you. What does all that mean? So now, what are you a part of? Mathis, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran. That's a shame before God. I mean, no disrespect. But I tell you, you can't find that in the Bible. I was watching the, the TV the other day. I watched it to see what's going on. It's just amazing the number. Well, we believe this and we believe this. I wanted to say, what does the Bible say? Nobody asked that question before this group. They were going toe to toe because they had different doctrines. And nobody was quoting thus what thus saith the Lord. And thus is this case of the world. And the people just follow these people. He's so charismatic. He's like, well, what is he saying? Just because he can rhyme doesn't mean it's the truth. That's why we have work to do, church. But it starts with us working on ourselves first. Because the world is pulled in so many different ways. You know, there's a religion where once the, once the worship starts, they bring out rattlesnakes. Now, I don't know about you all. If, we're, if I'm sitting up in a worship service and Gail's up here saying, come on, y'all, keep it loud. Come on, make it loud. I was like, okay, guys, open the door, bring them in. I'm like, oh, we got some visitors. And they start pouring out. They come in, they pour out the rattlesnakes. And the snakes are moving around and biting some of them. 
And they believe that when they're bidden, they took one scripture out of context to make a whole worship service. When they're bidden, they're going to be okay. I can't tell you the number that I stopped counting that ended up in the hospital. I'm thinking, are they going to get sued? The only person that sued was a, 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 a news person. Heard about it and was there and wanted to experience the whole thing. He ended up getting, he did sue the organization. But he lost because they told him what was going to happen before it happened. I don't know about you all. The minute they said, we're going to get rattlesnakes, I would have hit that exit door beside Sister Valley. That's, that's not a part of worship, but they'll take one little thing. The same congregation, the same denomination, or it's really a cult. Same cult said, before you walk out, we're going to wash everybody's feet. And if, and if you don't get your feet washed, you're not a Christian. And I was like, well, I researched why they do that. They feel because, remember when, when, uh, when uh, Christ told Peter to wash his feet and Peter said, oh, no, 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 forbid me. And then Jesus said, if I can't wash your feet, I want no party. And it's really funny. Then Peter said, you can wash me, uh, every part of my body. It's meant to be funny. But that wasn't meant to be anything that was part of worship. That was because they wore sandals and they, and they walked in dust back then. So it was considered honorable when somebody came to your house that you washed their feet. That was customary. It wasn't nothing religious about it, nothing with worship about it. We'd have to start a church at what, 7.30, Brother Gail, good. every time somebody came in, we had to wash their feet. That, that's because it was never a part of it. Now, don't get me wrong, I love a good massage, but that's not spiritual. Maybe we just, we got to know how to rightly divide, like the King James says. People just want to pull, well, I'm going to, like, like Burger King says, I'm going to have this my way. This is what my religion is about. And thus is the world today, the denominational world. You won't find that here in the Church of Christ. You're going to hear good Bible teaching. And you always will, as long as I'm blessed to be here with my brother. And my brothers, the Bible says, verse 19, and the sound of a trumpet. Oh, what is this? Is this music in the church? That's not the context of this. You got to keep the context. The context is Old Testament. They didn't have Dizzy Gillespie in the Old Testament or Herb Albert in the Old Testament. You know what they had? It was a ram's horn. The Hebrew word was shofar. And they blew it. Why? For musical entertainment? No. They blew it. It was a, an alarm of warning. It was to warn you something is coming that's threatening us. And it was to arm you, take up your arms, we're getting ready to go to battle. That's what it's for. When the Bible tells us, for us today, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, it actually says with the trump of God. That trump is short for trumpet. There's literally going to be a sound when Christ comes back. Is that somebody blowing a, a, a trumpet? Not in a physical sense. It's coming from heaven. But why is it a trumpet sound? It's a line that's letting us know now, okay, it's all done. Now God is going to judge this earth, and he's taking us out of here. The Bible says, for the dead in Christ shall rise first. My grandmother and a whole bunch of other people are going to come up out of the grave. And then it says, we shall rise with them. Those of us that are saved. Imagine that day. Those are the things we need to, to think of when we feel down. Because no matter what you're going through, no matter what, you got to remember, it's yet temporary. It's yet temporary. And I always say this to people when I, when I think about the, the resurrection of, 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 uh, of Christians. When you're, in, when you're going up into the air, what do you think you're going to be thinking about? You think you'll be thinking, oh, I wish I would have cut that last deal. Oh, I could have got that washer for two, two for one. You think, you think that's going to be on your mind? Oh, I wish I wouldn't have. Wouldn't. They promised me they was going to make me a T-bone steak tomorrow. I wish, Lord, can we pause one day so I can get that T-bone steak? You think that's going to be on your mind? Oh, it's going to be, I made it. Are you going to see your other brothers and sisters? Nothing is going to be even come close to what you're going to be thinking when you're going up to be with the Lord. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, and forever we shall be with the Lord. You know what's amazing about that word forever when you look up? It literally translates timeless. You know what that means? Like right now, I could say it's 9.33. Getting close to closing out. It's 9.33. We get to heaven. We ain't got to worry about time. Eternity is forever. But Jesus is going to meet with me at 10 o'clock. No, 
It's here and now. And as much as we need faith on this side of life, the day is going to come when we won't need faith. We need faith because we're not face to face with Christ. We have to live like we're face to face with Christ. That's what faith is. We get to heaven, he's there. The faith got us there. We don't need it anymore. That's why when you look at the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, and you read those things, it says, and now abide it. Faith, hope, and charity. Charity being love. And now, now being literally right now. Not when we get to heaven. We need the faith because we had to believe in Jesus because we can't see him. We need the hope because it's an anchor to our soul. And we need love because that defines who we are as Christians, as a people. We're not supposed to be brawlers. We're supposed to be peacemakers, loving people. That should be an indicator of a Christian. That's why if you go on your job, raising Cain all the time and all that, you got to ask yourself, am I a Christian? Well, these people ain't right. And I hate my boss. Well, you're not judging on what people do to you. You're judging on what you do to people. So are you going to be tough and be the Christian, the ambassador? That's a word we don't hear enough of. You know what ambassador, I know ambassador real well from being in the military. You know what ambassador means? You are representing somebody and you're in a foreign country. People say, I'm not in a foreign country. No, yes, you are if you're a Christian. We say all the time, we're, we're not citizens of this, of this. We're citizens in the physical sense, but our home, we're on a, we're on a pilgrimage here on earth. Our home is in heaven. So our true citizenship is in heaven. We're representing a little bit of heaven here on earth. How are you representing heaven? The Bible tells us we're living epistles. An epistle is like a book or a letter. In other words, sometimes the only God people may get in this world is what they see in you. So what are you representing? You walk on the job with a big old 30-foot cross and person always late saying, God bless you. Then when it's time to do the work, you're hiding in the corner. I ain't doing none of that. Let you do it. And I say that in jest, but I've seen that. It's like, why would I want to be a part of anything that you're doing religiously when I don't even see it in you? And we all have to look in the mirror with that. We are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. There's a phrase that I often hear, and it's so true. People say, just do it as unto the Lord. You got something that your boss has told you to do. Now, if it's illegal and immoral, that's too, That's a different category. But if he's told you to do it because he can and he is your boss, can you sit back and do it as unto the Lord? The last two jobs I had to tell myself that many times. It's like he just chose me because I'm an easy target. And I had to let that go. I said, do I know how to do it? Yeah. Can I do it? Yes. And I did it just to, to, to be a good Christian. You don't like the job and you got to change. But you can't sit there and just, oh, be all tore up and you're on the job every day. You're getting paid each week. You can learn a lot. The, the, the word submission is often misunderstood. It, it doesn't just apply to marriage. It applies to things in life, too. You may have to submit for a while till you have something better. What makes it real and what makes it beneficial is the way that you deal with it. You go up in the in the, uh, the, the the staff cafeteria. I can't stand that old so and so, so and so, and everybody like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He ain't no good. And that's the boss. How is that beneficial to you as a Christian? If he's literally doing you doing you wrong, you go talk to HR and do what you got to do. But how is that benefiting the work of Christianity? And how does that sound? That old so and so, so and so. Want to go to Bible study with me? I don't even go together. I love when people say, how do you go through that? You know me wrong. Because you're a Christian. The look, I love that look because they realize it's something different. And without them saying it, they're kind of saying they won't part of it. How are you represented? As I close out, you know, there are people, be it sports, uh, speakers, or anything. What makes a person really, really powerful is how easy they make something. I'm reminded of seeing my son play trumpet when he was growing up. And I would go and I wanted to learn about it. And I would watch videos on YouTube of people playing trumpet. And Prince hired this guy who was like 6'8". 
And they called him Big Ben, and he could play that trombone, boy, brother, your brother Charles. And he would get up there and just, da, 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 and then he could hold it up and make it sound like it was just such a pure, high, falsetto sound. And they sat down, and, he, and, and he, when they interviewed him, they said, how did you learn how to play it like that? He said, I just practice over time. And they said, is it easy? He says, no, it's just when you do it for so long, it becomes easy. And it, it only looks easy, it's not. And I was like, wow, that's exactly what Christianity is all about. People say, you know, just because Gail and I are elders don't mean we don't go through stuff. But how are you dealing with it? I can still go through something and get up here and teach and you would never know what I'm going through. Why? Because God is bigger than anything I go through. And God is able. The thing is, am I patient enough to let that happen? Y'all know where I end every time, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. Read that last part of 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. It says, and this was done that you may be able to bear it. So while I may be going through something in my mind, but I'm assigned to teach, I know God is preparing a way. Am I going to kick and fuss and make it worse? Or am I going to just rest in the Lord and do what he's told me to do? Thank you all for Bible study. As you know, we're going to break now and all the brethren are supposed to go to the fellowship hall. Those that are in the auditorium, please keep your mask on and make sure we maintain the social distancing. We will see you all again at 10 a.m., Lord Jesus.